All right. So good evening, everybody. It's great to have so many of you from across the country joining us tonight for our webinar on prostate cancer and the unique needs of the LGBTQIA plus community. My name is Terry Lakowski. I'm the director of us two support groups here at Zero, and I'll be serving as our webinar host tonight. I wanna thank our featured speaker, Dr. Ann Katz, for sharing her time and expertise with us today. And I'll introduce um, Dr. Katz in just a minute. So before we begin, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website at zerocancer.org um, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, it might take a couple days actually, but we'll try to get it up as soon as we can. Um, as soon as the webinar ends, you're gonna see a link to a survey and we would love for you to participate um, so we can get your feedback in that. So tomorrow you'll be receiving an email with the link to the recording and also the link to the survey. Um, for those that are of you who are not already familiar with Zero, Zero is the leading national nonprofit with the mission to end prostate cancer and help all who are impacted. Zero advances research, provides support, and creates solutions to achieve health equity to meet the most critical needs of our community. We offer an extensive portfolio of patient support programs and educational tools that are offered at no cost to patients and families. So if you or someone you know is in need of resources at any time while facing prostate cancer, please share these resources and let them know that we're here to help. Um, I'm gonna take one minute just to go over um, and highlight just a few of our support pro programs really quick before we get started. Um, we have 0360, which provides individual care case management to help patients and their families. Zero also offers peer-to-peer -peer support through our mentor and caregiver connector programs. So that's one and one-on-one -on -one support. And last fall, Zero and us two merged to become one patient-centric powerhouse. With that merger, the S2 support groups became the newest addition to the Zero support programming. Um, support groups are offered all over the country and they provide a space for people to connect with others in their community um, in person and virtually. Many of our groups are still meeting virtually and actually some of the groups are actually doing hybrid, which is in person and virtually at the same time. Um, we do have a virtual support group that meets two times per month, specifically for the LGBTQIA plus community. Partners and spouses are welcome to that too. So we'll put the link um, to that information in our chat box a couple of times throughout the webinar today. Um, we also have a full calendar of upcoming educational events and all the zero run walks across the US on our website. So today's webinar will be led by Dr. Ann Katz, who will provide us information on prostate cancer and the unique needs for the LGBTQIA plus community. We will then take questions from our audience. So please feel free to type your questions at any time in the Q&A. Um, that box is located at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer um, as many questions as we can. So now it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Ann Katz. Dr. Katz is a certified sexuality counselor and clinical nurse specialist at Cancer Care Manitoba. She is also an author, the past editor of the Oncology Nursing Forum and a regular contributor for the Between the Sheets column featured in our Zero Hour newsletter. So thank you, Dr. Katz for joining us today. And we're excited um, to hear from you tonight. And here we go. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Terry, for that warm introduction. Um, it's actually now three handfuls of books. <laughs> um, and I'm just busy writing the 16th. So I stopped counting at about five, to be honest. So I have no conflicts. I don't take money from the pharmaceutical industry or any kind of medical device uh, companies. But, uh, you know, if you if you call my books, which earn me enough royalties to, you know, maybe go out for dinner once a quarter, um, uh, that essentially is, is it in terms of um, uh, any sort of a financial conflict. Let me see if I can make this go. No. 
Sorry, everyone. I'm just looking for, there we go. Okay. So tonight uh, I'm going to talk about essentially uh, these two major topics. Um, I really believe that we don't have a health system, a healthcare system. I, I strongly believe we have an illness system that doesn't always serve us well. Um, I also referred to um, sexual and gender minorities uh, as a preferred term. If this is uh, offensive uh, or annoying to anybody, my apologies. Um, I've just found that this tends to well, in my view, is perhaps all-encompassing um, and something that perhaps people can, can more easily understand uh, rather than um, a, an acronym. So today I'm going to be talking about the size, effect, size effects of treatment, um, some of the unique challenges for sexual and ger gender minority people uh, who have experienced prostate cancer and, and the, the really significant side effects of treatment, as well as social support and certainly not leaving out the issue of uh, what, what happens to trans women and some of the challenges there. So to begin with, uh, you know, there's the whole issue of PSA screening. And I know that for many in the audience today, um, that ship has essentially sailed. Um, the US Preventive Services Task Force is the, the, the guiding uh, organization that makes recommendations around uh, various uh, screening tests, diagnostic tests, et cetera. And uh, a couple of years ago, they, they actually changed the recommendations and made a grade C recommendation for PSA screening in men ages 50 to 69. And the, the recommendation is that this is a personal decision that the man uh, makes with his uh, primary care provider, with his urologist, um, that there needs to be a discussion about the risks and benefits of screening. Uh, and this really does need to be something that the man consents to. I cannot tell you how many men I see in my practice who didn't even know that a PSA screening test was being done. And you'll hear me say screening over and over again because it is a screening test, it's not a diagnostic test. And for men over the age of 70, the recommendation is actually a D, which is don't do it. Uh, I know it sounds really ageist, uh, but this is based on the average longevity of men in North America uh, and that we really shouldn't be doing uh, a screening test like this, which is going to have huge consequences for the man and his partner uh, when he has a projected less than 10 years of life left. And, you know, I know that, that everyone seems to be living longer um, and there certainly are many men who are in their 80s and even beyond who would be denied screening and therefore denied treatment if a prostate cancer was found. Uh, so these are the recommendations. Are they obeyed to the letter? Absolutely not. Um, we also know that uh, sexual minority and bisexual men are more likely to have uh, the PSA screening test done, and we don't know why. Um, on the other hand, uh, sexual minority men are also more likely to experience shared decision making around this, which is a good thing, as opposed to heterosexual men. And, um, you know, once again, is this because of better engagement of sexual minority men with their healthcare providers, uh, given the history uh, of this population? Uh, we don't know, but, but I personally believe that this is a good thing. However, sexual minority men tend to be screened at a younger age, um, which essentially means that they are going to, if they are diagnosed with prostate cancer after a biopsy, they are going to live longer with the consequences of treatment, which um, many of you in the audience are experiencing, I would imagine. Um, and, uh, and this certainly impacts quite negatively on quality of life. So I think, uh, you know, this is something that um, I, I think we need to explore why, why are sexual minority men screened at a younger age? Uh, and what are the, well, we know the consequences, but you know, what would it make a difference if they, they were perhaps screened in their mid to late sixties rather than in their late fifties? There are a number of challenges within our illness system for sexual and gender minorities, which I'm going to talk about. And I just want to add, as a white cisgender woman, 
who is a bot on. Uh, I'm extremely humbled uh, that I have been invited uh, to, to lead this webinar uh, this evening. I have a fairly long history uh, of working uh, with sexual minority um, men and women for that matter. I spent um, the late 80s and into the 90s working in an HIV AIDS community clinic. So this is uh, an issue that is near and dear to my heart. So from the research, and this is fairly recent uh, research, we know that uh, prostate cancer is a very different experience for uh, men who have sex with men versus heterosexual men. Uh, and some of this I will explain in a minute. And certainly I would, I would like to hear your comments and, and questions at the end of my presentation. Um, even at the tools that we use to, for example, um, assess erectile function tend to be really heterosexist. So it's about um, penis in vagina intercourse. Um, and, and this certainly is frustrating, both for the men who we ask to complete these measures, as well as those of us who then have to interpret this. So, you know, just from a very really basic standpoint, um, if you're asked to fill out some sort of um, assessment tool, some sort of measurement, um, there is inbuilt bias often there. We also know that sexual minority men have greater dissatisfaction with care for a whole variety of reasons uh, that really do um, lay the blame on a very heterosexist um, healthcare or illness system where the assumption is that uh, everybody is heterosexual. Um, and that's at best. At worst, there are certainly um, issues related to, to stigma and discrimination and homophobia, overt or covert, which are just not acceptable. And this leads to isolation within the healthcare system. Certainly, I hear from um, some of my sexual minority patients that they really don't like going to uh, the one of the local support groups here because the men are mostly heterosexual. They will often bring their, their wife along to the meeting, um, and the sexual minority men really feel out of place at best and, and sometimes really feel discriminated against, uh, silenced, um, and stigmatized. Um, it is really only probably in the last seven to 10 years that we've seen a real growth in terms of research within sexual and gender minority populations uh, experiencing the side effects of prostate cancer. And so you will see if you can, if you can read the very small print uh, that a lot of the research that uh, I reviewed for this presentation, uh, it's relatively recent, which, which I personally think is, is a good idea um, and perhaps more reflective of the current situation. So the loss of one's prostate um, has special meaning for sexual and gender minority men uh, in terms of the prostate as a source of sexual pleasure, which uh, was identified um, as a significant loss by 64% by of the men in this study. Um, and really, we don't particularly talk about um, satisfaction in uh, in men who are the uh, receptors in, in anal intercourse. It's just, you know, it doesn't appear in any of the measures that, that we use for the most part uh, and is often uh, glossed over in, in healthcare settings. And for those of you who are, are seeing perhaps a, um, a gay urologist or physician, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, I would hope that things are a little bit better. Um, I had a rather heated conversation with uh, one of the urologists that I work with, who told me that he doesn't treat um, sexual minority men any differently to, you know, to everybody else. And um, that did not impress me, because I think we really do have to meet uh, patients where they are at, and I hesitate to use the word patient, um, but we really do need to, you know, to, to in a, in a way, uh, employ exceptionalism because each of our pa each and every one of our patients has a history, has a relationship, um, has had experiences within the healthcare system, and we have to really provide patient-centered care. So that that was not a particularly good experience, I have to say, and I really hope he learned something. Um, certainly, for 
uh, men who are in open relationships or unpartnered, uh, if you are not confident about your ability to achieve or maintain an erection, or you have had a failure, um, this certainly is going to impact on uh, your sexual self-confidence um, and can really, uh, you know, cause some men to avoid casual encounters just in case um, they fail to achieve an erection. And just the fear of that happening is enough to make it happen again and again and again. And that's called performance anxiety, uh, really going back to, to uh, Masters and Johnson. Uh, we know after radical prostatectomy, the surgical removal of the prostate, uh, that the valve or sphincter that keeps the bladder closed is damaged, destroyed, um, removed along with the prostate, and this leads to bladder leakage with arousal or orgasm. Uh, there's actually a medical term for this, and when a medical term exists, you know it happens often. So this can be, this loss of, of urine can be embarrassing. Um, it can be shocking to a partner. Um, it feels infantilizing to, to, to many men. Um, and um, just really, you know, for some men really distasteful. So um, that is really problematic and, and uh, hopefully there'll be some questions around what, you know, what can you do about that. Um, after a radical prostatectomy, the seminal vesicles, which are the two little organs that um, lie just um, above the prostate and connected by, by two little tubes. Um, this is where the fluid portion of the ejaculate is stored. And then with orgasm, the prostate um, contracts uh, pushing out the, the seminal fluid, which mixes with the sperm that are coming from the testicles. After radical prostatectomy, because the seminal vesicles and the prostate are removed, there is no ejaculation with orgasm. Um, and this can be highly problematic when uh, ejaculation is an overt sign of orgasm. So um, unlike women, uh, men cannot fake an orgasm. Uh, after radiation to the prostate, what we tend to see is reduced volume of ejaculate that over time will almost certainly completely disappear. Um, after surgery and radiation therapy, um, changes in the quality of orgasm can change. So we see that for some men, the sensation of orgasm remains the same. For some men, it is much, much reduced, perhaps even to the point of, of uh, sort of any lack um, of sensation. And some men will experience orgasms that are actually painful. Um, and I've certainly had some patients who have told me that they just actually don't want to have an orgasm anymore because it just really, really hurts. This is likely a product of uh, the pelvic floor a lot of the sensations of orgasm come from contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, and a pelvic floor physiotherapist can be your best friend and certainly someone with, who is the most resourceful in helping both to uh, control bladder leakage as well as uh, uh, the sensation of orgasm through contraction of those pelvic floor muscles. And then something really strange uh, happens and this is a little bit complicated, if you just give me a minute to, to explain this. So after radical prostatectomy, and it doesn't matter whether it's open, laparoscopic, or robotic, the nerves that control erections are damaged, sometimes destroyed, depending on the skill of the urologist, um, and to some extent, the degree of the prostate cancer, because if the cancer has gone outside of the prostate capsule, they are really not going to try and spare the nerves. Um, and the whole notion of, of nerve sparing is really an interesting one, and I think an overinflation uh, of what actually happens. But to just go back a minute, when those nerves are damaged, destroyed, or shocked during the surgery because there's a lot of pushing and pulling um, in the pelvis during the surgery. Those nerves no longer cause the nightly erections that men have as part of their sleep cycle. The purpose of those erections are to bring blood, oxygen, and nutrients to the tissues of the penis. 
in the absence of those nocturnal or nightly erections, we see the tissues of the penis really change and become fibrotic or like scar tissue because of they are starved of oxygen and nutrients. So when weeks, months later, when those nerves do start to wake up and they start firing, they're acting on a target or organ that doesn't um, react the same. And that lack of oxygen also causes penile shrinkage. This is a dirty little secret that often urologists are loath to tell men. Um, I don't know why. I think that everybody needs to be fully informed when they make a treatment decision. Um, but certainly it can be quite shocking uh, when the man discovers that his penis has shrunk sometimes up to about an inch in length and also in girth. Um, uh, Simon Roster out of Minneapolis um, has done this study that was published fairly recently. Um, there's a lot of information on the slide and I apologize, but really, you know, the take home from this is that a sexual function after treatment for prostate cancer is not good. Less firm erections, erections that are not sufficient for penetration, and certainly for anal penetration versus vaginal penetration, ere erections need to be much more rigid. In order to use a condom, you also require an erection that is really quite rigid. Um, so that is really important for safer sex. Um, men are report that they uh, can't reach orgasm. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. Some of it's psychological or emotional, but certainly uh, uh, perhaps from reduced sensitivity um, of the penis itself. Um, particularly for men who've had radiation, there is often uh, an impact of radiation on the, the, um, on the anus. Uh, and this leads to painful uh, receptive anal intercourse, bleeding, irritation, um, and, you know, over half here uh, of men in the study reported incontinence or bladder leakage during sex um, or orgasm. And then there's certainly the issue of, of the loss of sexual role. So if you are a top and you're unable to get erections, this is problematic. If you are a bottom and you um, experience pain with penetration, and once again, there we see a medical term, Anar dysparunia. Dysparunia just means pain with penetration, and this is anal pain. Um, so, so you know, some men are able to switch roles. Um, other men really can't, uh, or don't want to, or don't find it satisfying. So, this is hugely, hugely pro problematic. Um, and I'm really so thrilled that that uh, this study was done because I think it really does highlight um, the issues. And I think this should be compulsory reading for any urologist, radiation, or medical oncologist, and the nurses that work with them. Jane Usher is a um, researcher out of Australia who's done incredible work uh, with sexual and gender minorities. Um, a little bit older study, uh, but nevertheless really important. Uh, so this study, uh, there was a, she did a survey with over a hundred men and their partners, and then a smaller group um, uh, participated in one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, qualitative interviews. Um, and this really is, is, you know, I think really important and perhaps also highlights some of, of what uh, uh, Rossa did in, in his study. So, you know, the, the take home from the study was that erectile dysfunction changes everything for sexual minority men. Um, it has an emotional impact, but certainly, um, for some men, not all men, uh, adaptation can occur and uh, men can, you know, find a new way of being sexual that perhaps is as satisfying or something that they, that, that they can live with. Um, certainly identity re-evaluation, um, and this really does refer to um, you know, some of the engagement perhaps with casual partners um, to uh, perhaps less of a focus on erectile function uh, and more focus on sensuality and, and touch. Certainly that sexual renegotiation, which uh, Rossa speaks about, where perhaps sex, sex role identity uh, needs to change. Um, 
something that I think is really important to talk about is, and I hear this quite often, is men who tell me that after treatment, they really experience a loss of libido. Um, and this is reactive, right? So there is no physical reason for this. It's not an issue of hormone. And I'm going to talk about androgen deprivation in a little bit. So this is not an issue really that can necessarily be remedied uh, by some sort of medication. The reactive loss of libido refers to loss of interest in sex because of erectile difficulties, erectile changes, loss of erections. So it's almost a, well, you know, I can't function the same way, so why would I be interested? And this really does change you know, one's worldview and, and certainly sexual self-image. Uh, the issue of an ejaculation, the loss of ejaculate came up uh, in uh, Usher's study, reduction in, in penis size. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is the um, how bisexual men um, are often neglected, right? That, that we see the world in, in, and when I say we, I'm talking about healthcare providers, often see the world in, in really in a binary way. You're either straight or, or, or you're, you're gay. Um, and bisexual men are an entity to themselves. Uh, and very often we, you know, healthcare providers just don't know how to deal with this and uh, very often suffer from foot in, foot in mouth disease. Um, which is um, unnecessary. And, you know, I, um, I speak to a lot of oncology care providers um, and, and really um, not only encourage, urge, uh, but pressure them into just get educated, right? You need to be providing appropriate information that meets the needs uh, of your patients. So, you know, what about the Viagra, the Cialis, the Levitra, the pumps and potions and lotions, uh, the erectile aids? Uh, certainly sexual minority men uh, are, tend to use um, uh, these more often. However, they're not necessarily all they're cracked up to be. So certainly anything that is mechanical. So for example, the a penile pump um, is cumbersome. It's mechanical, it's not much fun. Uh, they often don't work particularly well. Um, this, the need to always be prepared to plan ahead really does take away from the spontaneity that most people enjoy. Um, sex is perhaps not that hot if you have to say, hang on a minute, I need to go and inject. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, a lot of these medications uh, cost way more money than they should. Uh, the excuse of research and development costs that need to be uh, recuperated is a lot of hooey. Uh, these drugs have been around for a really long time. Uh, even the um, uh, the drugs that are off patent, um, and so the generics tend to be as expensive as the as the trade drugs, uh, which is, um, you know, I just think shameful and price gouging, um, and certainly they don't always work. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the the issues is that in heterosexual relationships. Men in their 60s will often have a female partner who herself is in her late 50s or 60s postmenopausal and just not that interested anymore. And I'm certainly, you know, painting this with a really broad brush. Um, but, you know, I certainly from the heterosexual couples that I see, uh, you know, the woman say, eh, you know, sex was never that good anyway. So, you know, I, I really don't mind uh, that we don't do it anymore. And I think there's certainly a difference um, uh, in, in, their, in their male partner who is more interested. Uh, and, you know, I think there's, there's a whole psychological, emotional and sort of sociological uh, background uh, to this. But certainly for sexual minority of men, sexual interest, sexual activity tends to um, last way longer. Um, and so the loss of this is uh, a, a huge issue. Um, I want to talk a little bit about androgen deprivation therapy, which is misnamed so often, and this is another area where I uh, sort of go face to face with uh, my medical and uh, 
radiation and surgical oncology colleagues because uh, they talk about hormone therapy or they say, I'm going to give this man hormones. Uh, they're not giving the man hormones. They're giving them medication that uh, really decimates their testosterone uh, because testosterone is the fuel for prostate cancer. And living in a state of androgen deprivation is really something that um, I don't think you can imagine unless you have experienced this. So there are profound changes and they tend to be global changes as well. So loss of sexual interest or libido in 85 to 100% of men, I think sometimes it's actually more in the range of 95 to 100% of men, um, certainly profound erectile dysfunction. And um, th these men do not respond generally to Viagra, Cialis or um, Levitra. So the oral pills really don't work. Um, genital shrinkage, so both penile shrinkage and, and shrinkage of the scrotum. So a big impact on body image. Also with the loss of upper body muscle strength um, and weight gain. And it tends to be that spare tire kind of uh, weight gain in the uh, midsection. Um, increased irritability and sensitivity, which some men, you know, seem to, to uh, deal with kind of quite well, um, other men really not. Um, and then long-term use, uh, and some men will be on this medication for 24, 36 months, or for some men who have advanced uh, or recurrent prostate cancer that doesn't respond uh, well to, um, <clears throat> to treatment, they will, you know, so they're, they're um, PSA um, doesn't go down, so their prostate cancer is still active, um, they will be on androgen deprivation therapy for the rest of their life or until it no longer works and they need second or third line therapy. And this long-term use is associated with the development of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, some question around dementia as well. So androgen deprivation therapy really, you know, has a huge, huge impact on general quality uh, of life and really will change things quite fundamentally. Um, <clears throat> having prostate cancer affects your social life. Um, Certainly uh, your chosen family may step up and we certainly see you know, a, a lot of support, but sometimes they just don't know how to deal with this. Um, and some, uh, the, the research suggests that some men actually isolate themselves because they don't want to burden somebody else. And I think you know, the context of HIV AIDS uh, for the last uh, 25 to 30 years, I think has really um, affected uh, sexual minority of men in a really fundamental way in terms of reaching out, um, both in a positive and perhaps also a negative way, um, reaching out for support. We know that men who are in a relationship um, actually do better than men who are not because they're, they're, the support from their partner uh, is really helpful in helping them come to terms with uh, the, their altered life. Um, certainly, as I mentioned before, the challenges of traditional support groups, um, and certainly I know that, that uh, Zero Cancer has appropriate support groups. Um, and if any of you are not uh, participating in those, I really strongly urge you to do that. Um, you know, I think our, our healthcare, our illness care uh, settings really don't necessarily do this well. Certainly, if you live in a large metropolitan area, it is going to be easier to find um, a support group for sexual minority men. If you live in a smaller center or a rural area, this may not be possible. So virtual support groups are really playing a very, very important role here. Um, and you know, an interesting, an interesting study from uh, Elizabeth Arthur uh, at the James. She's actually a former member of the uh, editorial advisory board of, of the journal that I was the editor of. Um, she did, uh, she looked at the issue of, of partners of uh, sexual minority men who have prostate cancer uh, and their invisibility uh, in the healthcare system. So if you do not feel welcomed 
as a sexual minority male if you do not feel safe, uh, if you are concerned about uh, certainly heterosexism or homophobia where you are getting care, you are unlikely to bring your partner with you. Um, and partners need support too. So this is certainly um, a, a, you know, a problem, I think, particularly um, in smaller and, and rural areas. So what, what can you do? Um, I've certainly presented um, a, honestly, a fairly negative perspective on, on living with, with prostate cancer as a sexual minority man. And I would certainly encourage uh, you to, to um, challenge me um, or ask questions or comments. Um, you know, the, the easy, the, the sort of facile question as a response might be just change your expectations. And that absolutely isn't easy. Um, and I think anyone who says that that's what you should do uh, really uh, does not have a full understanding of what sexual and role identity really is. Um, certainly if uh, you, you know, if you have that constant or semi-constant, or uh, particularly when you're when you're in a sexual situation, uh, that you you have that loop of of negative thoughts. You know, the the little voice in your head that says, "Remember what happened last time, and you couldn't get an erection, or you urinated, um, you know, during a sexual encounter." Um, certainly, mindfulness-based meditation can really help to keep you in the moment to silence some of the some of that negative messaging you know we've seen this to be really helpful for people who experience anxiety uh, related to uh, sexual activity um, but it is a practice it is not you know sort of a one shot uh, fixes everything uh, mindfulness is a practice you have to do it every day um, so that it becomes somewhat automatic Something that will work in terms of erectile uh, dysfunction is penile self-injection because they work. I'm a huge fan uh, of, of this. And um, part of my practice actually is to uh, educate men who want to try uh, injecting themselves. And I do the education and test dose uh, of the medication. It's relatively cheap. Um, it's relatively easy to do and certainly, you know, I don't have a penis um, and uh, I, I certainly know that, that men do not grow up thinking, oh, one day I'm going to stick a needle in my penis in order to have an erection, but it works. Um, uh, so certainly if that, you know, that is something perhaps you, you, you may want to consider. It's really important to be taught how to do it properly. Um, generally no side effects other than an erection that won't quit and that is due to a, to using too much medication um you know i think everyone sort of has a little bit of a giggle about you know if you have an erection lasting longer than four hours contact your doctor um an erection lasting you know longer than I would suggest two hours, uh, perhaps even one hour is really going to damage the tissues of the penis and you don't want that to happen. And finally, you know, find a support group because the support of your peers is the best support uh, that that you can find because, uh, you know, these are these are men who have walked not in your shoes, but in similar shoes. Um, finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the issue for transgender women, and I put woman and I meant to type women, my apologies. So very few transgender women are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this is because uh, in the transition, in the medical transition, uh, these people will take essentially androgen deprivation therapy to lower or significantly reduce the amount of testosterone produced in their body. And they will also take estrogen to um, create a more feminine form. So both of these should reduce the risk of developing prostate cancer. However, not always. And I think part of the issue here is that if you are a trans woman who has made the psychological transition to being a woman, perhaps you do not think of your prostate on a regular basis. It may have shrunk 
to, you know, to just a little nubbin under the influence of testosterone. And certainly in past times, men with prostate cancer were given estrogen as a way of driving down their testosterone as a, a treatment for prostate cancer. It didn't really work because it also increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, but but perhaps as a trans woman, you are not thinking about the need for PSA screening. And the recommendation is that trans women have regular PSA screening and there is a lower threshold for a prostate biopsy. Uh, the issue for trans women in our healthcare or illness system uh, are complex uh, with lack of access to care and certainly lack of knowledge. Uh, of um, healthcare providers. So it is complicated, um, but fortunately, you know, really a low, low prevalence um, of, this, of, of this cancer um, in this population. Um, just certainly some resources for you, zero uh, cancer, certainly a great resource, the National LGBT uh, cancer Network, I'm wondering when they're going to change their name, uh, Male Care, Cancer Care, Fuck Cancer, and uh, Prostate Cancer Canada, which is now part of the Canadian Cancer Society. So I promised Terry that I would speak for 40 minutes and leave lots of time for questions, and I really do welcome your questions. Uh, these are uh, uh, the books that I think might be appropriate. Uh, the second edition, so the one in the middle of Prostate Cancer and the Man You Love is coming out in the fall. I've just actually seen the cover, that is it. Um, and this book is for the partners of men with prostate cancer, um, but certainly I think there's lots of information in there for you. Um, the chapters are stories with evidence-based guidance, uh, both for the man with cancer, but particularly for his partner. And uh, if you buy the book, I'll be able to go out for dinner. So that's it for me. Um, I've stopped sharing, I hope. And uh, Terry, fire away with the questions. So I'm laughing. That was funny. So um, first of all, Anne, you are getting a ton of love here. Lots of great positive Hello. comments. We Thank love you, you Anne. All that good stuff. So <laughs> we do have a lot of questions. So let me just try to get to some sure. of the, the juice of some of these here. Um, so one of the questions says, um, I am in a relatively new relationship. We practice selfless sex, but I would really like to get my libido back. Uh, stage four on Lupron, Zytiga, prednisone. I have no sex drive. Is there any research that can help revive the libido? Oh, goodness. So, you know, because prostate cancer is androgen or testosterone dependent, we, as this individual has experienced, we deprive them of testosterone. And in terms of medication, that would be the only thing that would help with libido in terms of medical things, you know, but I think there is certainly um, a, a way of, you know, but this takes work, right, um, of trying to boost interest in terms of pornography can perhaps help, right, you know, overt stimulation, uh, certainly being absolutely frank and honest with your partner that you may not be the initiator, but you are certainly prepared to be the receiver of the initiation. Uh, so men will often, you know, experience what we call responsive desire when a, when a sexual um, approach is made by one's partner. Um, so if you sit around waiting for your libido to kick in, you're going to be sitting around for a really long time. So communication, 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 right? If you don't tell your partner what you are thinking and feeling, he is going to assume. Um, and if it's a relatively new partner who doesn't know you very well, the assumption is likely to be wrong. Um, uh, you know, and, and even when you're with a long-term partner, we, we make assumptions that are wrong. So communication is really, really clear. And if you indicate that you are willing to be receptive, I think that can go a long way as well. So guys, I'm just going to say this right now. 
there's a really bad storm happening behind me. So I really hope I don't lose my power. So let's try to get through as many of these questions as I can. And if I lose power, um, you guys won't lose power. So just so you know, in case, in case I disappear. Um, so let's move on. Uh, Let's see, what have you found the best solution for climaturia? Does an artificial sphincter work? Yeah, so climacturia, uh, leaking during arousal or orgasm. So, you know, the climax really re refers to leakage during orgasm. And that's because the, um, the um, when you're aroused and certainly when you're during an orgasm, the pelvic floor muscles kind of give way. And so this is why there's there's a loss of urine. So certainly, you know, making sure that you urinate before sex. Um, and if there's a lot a lot of sex play before, you know, before orgasm, you're going to, you know, try get to the bathroom um, again. Um, certainly an artificial sphincter can help. Uh, a pelvic floor physiotherapist may also be really helpful. Um, some people will have a really tight pelvic floor and then you're more likely to have uh, to lose urine. Um, so, a, you know, a really a good pelvic floor physiotherapist is, is your best friend. Certainly an artificial sphincter can help as well. But I've certainly seen reports with pain, with orgasm, uh, when there's an artificial sphincter, um, which, you know, might be okay. I don't know. Um, uh, but certainly there is a risk of that. But yeah, an artificial sphincter. So this is like a little donut uh, that is inflated, that is surgically placed uh, around the urethra, close to the neck of the bladder. And when you want to urinate, you actually engage a little valve, which deflates this like little donut shaped balloon, um, allowing for, for urine to flow. So um, yeah, certainly, but you know, get an experienced surgeon to do that. And you're entitled to say to somebody, can I talk to one of your patients? How many of these have you done? Uh, you know, that's important. Excellent. Okay, here's the next question. My surgeon quoted 12 to 24 months recovery. I was a patient for the first 12 months, but from about month 14, I was incredibly frustrated, primarily because my frequent nocturnal erections were way better than anything, um, anything I or my partner could conjure up when we wanted an erection. And why is, does that happen? <laughs> So first of all, yay, I'm really glad uh, things improve. You know, sometimes a surgeon will say, oh, you know, you can see improvement up to four years. No, I think 24 months at the outset, you know, what you have at 24 months is about as good as it's going to get. You know, I think perhaps the, the better nocturnal erections is related to your brain, right? That, you know, when you're, when you're, playing sexually and you want to have an, an erection, um, you know, the, the brain can interfere in that. So, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm just really glad that, that things improved um, and, you know, 21 months. Well, yeah, that's a long time. It's a long time to wait, but you know, sometimes there are happy endings. Okay. Next question. Do some or all of the prof profound changes due to ADT return to normal after ADT is finished? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, kind of, sort of, not really, it depends. Um, you know, certainly, um, I see the hot flashes, and I didn't list that as a as one of the the nasty side effects of androgen deprivation. Um, I certainly see men, you know, experiencing uh, still experiencing hot flashes, like e nine, twelve, sometimes eighteen months. Um, in terms of uh, sexual function, um, probably about I think it's 25 there was just a, a recent study that was published I think about 25 percent of men will return to their baseline function right so you've also got to add in age right because age is not a friend to the penis so if you're on androgen deprivation for 24 months you're now two years older right and there certainly are age associated changes um it's a you know it's really hard to predict this um you know i think if you've if you're on androgen deprivation for three or six months the likelihood of things uh, going back to somewhat normal but you've always got a factor in your brain right and and that performance anxiety that plays a huge role okay let's see 
What is your opinion of testosterone replacement if your testosterone is below 200 mg? So is this in the context of prostate cancer? So this, you know, this is a, a really controversial topic. Um, there are some, um, I'm not sure if I should, well-known urologists, Dr. Abe Morgenthaler is one of them, who, you know, who, who really sort of has debunked the whole notion of the role of testosterone in the development of prostate cancer, because, you know, his, he says that if prostate cancer develops because of testosterone, why don't young men, right, who have high testosterone all get prostate cancer? Why does this tend to be um, a disease of older men who, who have lower testosterone levels. Um, so this is his, you know, this is his bent and he's written a book about it. I can't remember the title, but if you Google Dr. A. Morgenthaler, you will find his book. Um, so urologists, oncologists are often really reluctant to um, prescribe testosterone for men with prostate cancer, because the concern is that this will fuel a dormant prostate cancer that might be hanging out in a lymph node, for example, or somewhere else in the body, that if you give the man additional testosterone, it's going to, to um, you know, sort of set that, uh, that, that little bit of, of cancer um, into growth, and then you have a recurrence and the man's in, in trouble. Um, certainly, I know, you know, from patients that they are getting testosterone online, that they're getting it from their friends at the gym. Um, and, you know, do we know what happens to these men? The short answer is no. Um, you've also got to be really careful about, I mean, about buying things that, you know, may be natural um, online, because often, you know, they will actually have testosterone in them, but it's just not listed. So you really do have to be really careful. I think, you know, I think this is a conversation with your urologist. Certainly, if you have no evidence of disease uh, for a number of years, for example, after a radical prostatectomy, your PSA has remained undetectable. Um, you know, I think uh, you may want, you you may make an informed decision as long as it's truly an informed decision and you understand the risks and then your urologist uh, may be, um, uh, you know, may write you a prescription for testosterone. It's very, very controversial. Thank you, Anne. So I'm gonna keep going here because we've got a couple more questions that I'd love to do. So, okay, this one's a little bit longer, but about 15 months after surgery, I am finally responding to stimulation and the Viagra prescribed by my urologist. At first, it didn't seem to work, but now there is a pronounced reaction, mostly pleasurable, but also mechanical. Are there warnings on how often I can take the Viagra or the Viagra substitute? Sometimes organ is somewhat painful, but mostly nice. I still want to experience it. So, um, you know, about Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, any, you know, any of those medications, um, you take according to the instructions. I'm not sure, um, men are often not told how to take the medication properly. So I often will get a referral, please see this man, he failed Viagra. That just drives me up the wall. The man didn't fail anything. If anything, the medication failed him. More often, it's that the prescriber failed the man in telling him how to take the medication. So quickly, you have to take, well, you should take the medication on an empty stomach. If you really do have to eat, don't like do a cheeseburger and fries with some onions on the side. Um, so an empty stomach, you have to wait about 45 minutes to an hour for the medication to circulate in the body. The medication doesn't cause an erection, right? It only interferes in an enzyme reaction at the cellular, boring, 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 which, pre which prevents the blood vessels from constricting, pushing blood out of the penis into the general circulation. There has to be genital stimulation in order for the medication to work. You can't just, and I can't tell you how many of my patients have said to me, because this is what I ask. So how did you take the medication? They go, mm, blonde woman, what does she know? <laughs> no, answer the question, right? Well, I took the medication and then nothing happened. Yeah, 
because there was no genital stimulation. You have to do that to physically get blood in the penis and the medication will then work to prevent the blood vessels from constricting, pushing the, the blood out. So, you know, um, you should probably not take more than one every four hours or every eight hours, I would suggest, and take a full dose. Don't muck around with 25 or 50 milligrams, take a hundred milligrams, right? There's, you know, don't, if you have like really robust erections that maybe then think about if you want to, to cut uh, the pull in half and they're really hard to cut in half. So please be careful, keep your fingers out the way. Um, they are not designed to be, to be cut in half, the, the hundred milligrams. Um, and you can absolutely, I mean, you can ask for as many pills as your bank balance will support. Um, so, you know, really no, no harm in that. So if I've tried Viagra and it didn't work, does that mean it will never work or should I try again? You should absolutely try again. Uh, we suggest that you try on five to eight separate occasions, right? Because just swallowing a pill that costs 15 bucks is pressure, right? And, and, and that, that wanting it to work because you spent all that money, um, well, you know, for some men just means it doesn't work. So, you know, take it on five to eight separate occasions. If Viagra doesn't work, try Cialis. If Cialis doesn't work, um, I don't even know if Levitra is still um, available. And I think in the US, you can actually get a Vanifil now as well. We, I don't think we have that in Canada yet. Okay, let's see. I leak urine when I'm aroused. Is there anything I can do to help with that? Um, you know, certainly treating the cause, right? So pelvic physiotherapy, perhaps an artificial sphincter. Um, you know, people will sort of in a really kind of superficial way say, well, just wear a condom. Um, doesn't always work, right? Because of the rigidity uh, required. Some men find that using a cock ring or constriction band can help as well. You've just got to be really careful with that because um, in order for it to prevent leakage, the constriction band or cock ring has, has to be on really, really tight. Um, and it can only be in place for about 30 minutes uh, because um, it, it holds perfusion of the tissues. Um, also your penis is gonna feel cold, which sometimes for a partner is not um, that pleasurable. Okay, let's see, we have, let me see. This one is interesting. Have you ever heard of the fenogreek herb? due to being a slow way of raising testosterone. So it's F-E-N-U-G-R-E-E-K. Yeah. yeah, I happen to like fenugreek in my curry. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, I am not an expert on these natural um, herbs and supplements. It's a huge field of study. And um, my poor brain, my poor post-menopausal and post-COVID brain, uh, you know, doesn't have much room in it. Um, I honestly don't know. Um, and certainly, you know, I think ask a pharmacist um, if it is safe to use with the other medication that you are on as well. They actually have a database where they can actually look at interactions between natural, these sort of natural and herbal remedies and and traditional medical um, medication. So so as you know, I, I hesitate to say ask a naturopath because often they're the ones that are that are proposing and selling these um, these substances. So I think we got one more question. Well, there's a lot of questions we haven't asked that we'll we'll get these all to you and after, but um, this is a good question. Is there a dermal way of taking a stimulant for erection? don't understand the question. I don't either. So is there a dermal way of taking a stimulant for erection? I just thought maybe I didn't know. Like through the skin? Mm. I, get, I think that that what, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I honestly yeah. don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Okay, let's see. Okay, well, one more question, because it's just a follow back up on the, Vi the Viagra. It says, did you say it's okay to take 100 milligrams of a Viagra every four hours, or did he miss here? No, so so it was, I'm sorry, it was a, a rather sort of snarky response. I mean, I would suggest once a day. The issue with Viagra is that because it promotes 
dilatation of blood vessels, it's going to lower your blood pressure. So you have to be really careful, particularly if your blood pressure is low to begin with. So, you know, one of the reasons why people have side effects from Viagra, nasal congestion, facial flushing, headache, sometimes heartburn is because of the, the blood vessel dilatation. Um, and so, you know, if you've taken Viagra and you're lying down doing whatever, um, you should not leap up from a horizontal position because you could actually faint. Um, and, and certainly if you are, uh, you know, if you are using um, nitroglycerin for chest pain, you probably shouldn't be using Viagra at all because of that risk of, of lowering your blood pressure. Uh, you know, I would suggest with any of these things once a day, right, because your individual metabolism will, will impact on how the, the medication actually is metabolized and leaves your, and leaves your, your system. So the ha we say that the half-life of Viagra is about four hours. Um, and, you know, and, but for some men, it's eight hours. So I've got patients who've taken 100 milligrams of Viagra and with stimulation, they're actually able to get an erection the next morning. So that means that they are slow, they're, you know, they're slow metabolizers. So please um, just, you know, take what I said with a grain of salt. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, you know, you've got to be careful with humor. <laughs> sorry. All right, thanks, Anne. Well, guys, we, everyone, we are out of time. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, yes. And I, I can probably get some of these questions to you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, just sort of one thing. Please, if anybody wants to ask me a question and, and somebody actually just um, put their, their email in, uh, in the chat, which I'm not going to be able to, to um, access after this. My email address is drannkatz at gmail.com. So D-R-A-N-N-E-K-A-T-Z at gmail.com. I also have a website, severely neglected, but you can contact me through that, which is just drannkatz at uh, drannkatz.com. But please remember, it's Anne with an E. Um, uh, it's important. It's the only real kind of Anne. Uh, Terry, this was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for those great questions, for the comments. I am humbled and honored to, to do this. And honestly, please email me if you have another question. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, for everyone else, just a quick reminder, um, this is the first of a series of webinars that we're going to be doing. So um, hopefully at least one more this year, maybe two. I'm sure Anne will come back and be with us again sometime next year. So we're really excited. Um, we're sitting down with my two moderators um, from our group to talk about suggestions for topics and um, some potential speakers. Um, we're also gonna be able to focus on some speakers for the um, our March summit. So if anyone has any um, specifically gay urologists, oncologists that they're really fond of, please share that information um, with us here at Zero. So um, thank you everyone so much. One more reminder, you'll be getting our survey. Please um, take a minute to fill that out. Um, if you can't do it tonight, no problems. We'll send you that email tomorrow um, along with a link for the recording of today. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Anne. Thank you everyone. Glass right. of wine waiting for me. I was going to say, enjoy that wine. <laughs>